Hello, this is Yan Fu Kuo from National Taiwan University again. And uh, today we are uh, going to talk about uh, the Unit 9 actuators. And the topics for today is uh, DC motor, encoder for DC motor, and other motors. Okay, and this is the, uh, the outline of the uh, topic. So we'll start from solenoid and talk about DC motors, their working principles, uh, the modeling of DC motors, and then talk about a little bit about Laplace transform. Then we'll move to model reduction, then DC motor driver. And once we have a DC motor, we'll talk about the encoder for DC motors, and then we'll talk about three other motors that includes stepper motor, brushless DC motor, and RC servo motor. So for the solenoid, uh, this is uh, of an electron electromagnetic device. Uh, so what is a solenoid? It's a actually a very uh, common actuator. Here you can see a solenoid. It has four parts. First is a movable armature core. So this is this red part is a movable armature coil. Then there's a coil, and there's a spring, and there's a stationary iron core. So basically that red part is movable, right? So it's called mov movable armature, okay? And the stationary iron core is stationary, it doesn't move, okay? And when we uh, provide voltage to the coil, and there's a current goes through the coil, that movable armature will be moved. Uh, it's going to be moved down, okay? And it will compress that spring over here, okay? And after that uh, voltage across the coil is gone, the spring will push back the movable armature core. So once the uh, voltage is provided, the armature is moved down, and once the uh, voltage is gone, then armature uh, is going back. So this is the way that we can control the, uh, the the movable armature, and this is a solenoid. So let's uh, watch a demo video of a uh, project. Uh, in this project, the students build a melodica using solenoids. And let's watch this video. This is our mechatronics project. It's an uh, automatic playing melodica. It's called Project Autica. Uh, a melodica, as you can see, is a keyed instrument. It, uh, also, it's a wind instrument. Uh, it's similar to a harmonica or, a, uh, or an accordion. It has a bunch of reeds inside there that vibrate when the air goes through. Uh, we have 25 solenoids to cover two complete octaves. Uh, all those pole solenoids, when fired, will pull down all these linkages and uh, depress the keys. Um, go ahead. Um, it's controlled by the control panel on the front here. You've got uh, just a switch that controls an actuator that turns on and off the air, um, which comes from a compressed air tank. And then you've got a 12 key keypad. Um, course, each key corresponds to a song, so you just hit a key in it plays that song. Um, we've got a speaker here that plays a little startup tune, lets you know that it's ready to go. And then our display um, tells you what song it's playing and what the duration of that song is. And then we've got a light sensor here that will, in automatic mode, it will play the appropriate song. Uh, we created the songs uh, in Excel. Uh, we've created a spreadsheet that we just can use ones uh, to signify that we want a note played. And uh, we set the duration in milliseconds. and That'll convert it into binary numbers, and that's sent over to a text file, and on from there onto the picks. white keys uh, connected to solenoids on the front here, and then we have all the black ones in the back. 
So this is and, uh, the solar board. Yeah, so you can go ahead and see how they work. the automatic mode. Go ahead and press star right here. This is right in the room right now. It should uh, play Reveille here in just a minute. It's using the light sensor. For automatic mode, it takes in an analog signal and uh, display, uh, plays the correct song accordingly. So you're going to cover up the light sensor now? Yeah, I'm going to cover up the light sensor this time. And I'll go ahead and press automatic mode again. This little box right here is uh, controlling this light right here, providing the current port. Uh, we also have our speaker, our LCD, our keypad, and this battery right here is controlling the uh, valve that lets the air in and out. So we have our master pick, which uh, goes and tells all the rest of the picks, our LCD pick, our A to D conversion pick for the light sensor, and then our song pick, which song to display. Uh, then we have it run over uh, to this relay board here from the pick, and it sends the 5-volt signals to the relays which then converts it to a 12-volt source so we can pull down the solenoids. As you can Mention see, it's run off of uh, two 300-watt PC power supplies. One of them is for all the solenoids. The other one is simply for the circuit. Okay, that's about uh, solenoid. Now we are going to move to another topic, DC motor. So a DC motor looks like this. It's a very uh, common actuators in our daily life. You can uh, actually see it everywhere. So let me provide some background information about DC motors. And DC motors are invented long time ago, back in the uh, 19th century by Faraday. Okay, it's a very simple operation. Uh, what we do is we provide some uh, electricity some current through some coil, and the coil will generate some uh, dynamic uh, motion. So basically, it's an operation that converts uh, electricity energy to dynamic energy. And there are two basic uh, operation modes. One is voltage mode. The other is the current mode uh, for different purposes. And the uh, uh, operation principle includes torque generation and the back electromagnetic force or back EMF okay and these two principles work together to make the DC motor uh, work we'll talk about the details about them later let's uh, watch a, a short video uh, for demo uh, so we, we can understand the parts of DC motor this is a small permanent magnet DC motor that's rated at about one and a half to three volts it consists of an outer stator shown here with the rotor inside of it and you can see the permanent magnets on the inside of the stator housing this is a clearer view of the magnets the magnets provide fields radial field lines that interact with the coils of the rotor this is what the field lines look like the inside surface of the magnets are at a south pole the outer surface is at a north pole creating these field lines that are radially oriented towards the armature of the motor. There are actually two different types of magnets in the motor. And as you can see, because they attract each other in this orientation, one face must be north, the other face must be, must be south. And likewise, if we try to press them together this way, they repel each other. They do not want to stick together. This is the rotor and the brush support 
which is also the end cap of the motor. The brushes are small copper tabs that keep contact with the commutator as the rotor rotates. The commutator has one, two, three separated segments on it that make contact with these two brushes as it turns. The result of that is that the coils, there are three separate coils in the motor, uh, receive current in different directions, creating magnetic fields that are intensified by these laminated poles here that interact with the fixed fields of the stator, causing the motor to rotate. So as the uh, video just mentioned that in a DC motor, we have uh, several uh, parts. The first is the rotor. So what is the rotor? The rotation in parts of the motor. So you can see that in the center of the motor, that's a part that, is, uh, that keeps rotating. That's the rotor. And the stator is the stationary part of the motor. So this is the stator. And uh, part of the stator is the permanent magnets that provide a uh, magnetic flux. That's called the field system. Okay. And armature is the part motor that uh, interact with the magnetic flux to provide the torque. So. Uh, Armature is actually a composed of many parts, but basically uh, it's the rotor itself. And brushes, you can see brushes. So brushes is the part of the electrical circuit, okay, that will keep the motor rotates. And it supplies the voltage to the armature too, okay. So we'll talk about why we need a brush later. And commutator is used to uh, change the direction of current because you want the motor to keep rotate so you need to uh, change the direction of the current so let's to take a look at the principle of uh, commutation okay we need we know that uh, the current has to flow through the coil and it has to flow through the coil at a certain uh, direction so it will provide the correct uh, force to push the motor to rotate and the cur current has to exchange their direction say uh, we have a uh, magnetic field system in the inside the DC motor and this is the north and this is the south okay and then we put a wire in this field system okay and the wire is separated by these two parts okay so the current doesn't flu uh, flow through these two parts but the current can go through these coils okay in either direction it depends on uh, where is the uh, anode where is the cathode of your battery but in any case that's uh, connect this wire with a uh, commutator okay so you can see these are the two commutators and this is the anode and this is the cathode of the battery okay so you connect this to a battery this is the uh, cathode and this is the anode okay and how does the current flow through this uh, uh, wire so basically this is the anode right so the current will uh, flows through the coil, coil uh, from this direction. Then go back to the cathode in this direction, right? So that's what you can see on the slide. So the current basically goes through uh, here in this path, and when the rotor rotates. Then your coil will be rotated together w with the uh, armature. So it rotates to this direction. Then you can see this is the anode. So you can see that the current will flow through the coil in this direction and go to the cathode. Right? So again, you'll see these two direction 
Okay, so the armature keep rotates, and the current change their direction. So uh, by using this principle, the rotor will keep rotates at uh, one direction, and this is called commutation. Okay, that's a very important principle in DC motor. Okay, then uh, how does a t DC motor move? So the motor itself must generate some torque, and the torque is large enough to push the DC motor, and then it rotates. So how does it generate the torque? It requires two elements. So uh, what we have is that we have a electromagnetic field, okay? In the magnetic field that uh, we have a flux, and the flux density is B. You see this capital B over here. And just imagine that you have a magnetic system here, and this is north and this is south. Okay, so you have some uh, flux with density B close from uh, this wire. Okay, so you, ha you have this wire, the length of wire is L. And then in order to make this wire move, you need to supply some current, okay, in this wire. And suppose the current is in this direction, from the back, from the inside of the slide goes to outside of the slide, okay? And the, uh, the current is Ia, okay? So these are two, uh, two nodes, the I and V. And uh, we know that uh, with this current I and this flux density B, and the force generated by this wire is DL plus B, okay? And use your right hand, you can say that L, you, you point the direction of uh, L. L is uh, outside uh, this slide, right? And B is up, it's going up, right? So you have force that is uh, coming out from the center of your uh, palm, okay? So this is the direction of the force F. So this DF is DL cross B, DL cross B. So this is the direction of the F. And then we integrate this DL, that means we put a integration over here. We know the length of the wire is L. So we know that the electromagnetic force uh, is F is I uh, times L times V, okay? I times L times Z. Okay, and we don't have only one wire in the, uh, in the magnetic system because when we wire uh, the uh, DC motor, we actually wire it many uh, rounds. So you can see that coil has many, many wires uh, over it, okay? So we have to consider that too. And suppose for one wire, the current I goes from he this direction all the way to here. And we know that the length of the wire is L. And we also know the radius of the wire is R, okay? And so what's the torque that it generated by this uh, system? So let's, let's think about that. For this wire, for this wire, because your I is over here, over this direction, and your B, let's see, the V, the flux, is over this direction. So it gives you a force that is coming out from your palm that's going up, right? So it gives you a force over here, this direction. 
but there's another wire here, right? And the current of this wire in this AB segmentation is opposite to this CD segmentation. So one is going up and the other is going down. So this gives you a force that is going down, okay? So let me see, yeah. I have F here. One F is going up and the other F is going down. So that's the reason why it keeps that core, uh, coil rotates. Okay, so we can see that, so here we have one, one wire here and another wire here. So totally is two. That your force for this coil is two, right? So we have two F, one F over here and another F over here. Okay, and we have a, so thinking about this is the center of the rotation. We have R over here and F over here. What is your torque? Your torque is what? F times R, right? And you have two wires, so you times two over here. So two times F times R. F is the force, R is the radius. And force times radius is the torque, right? And because there are two wires in one coil, so we have two. Two times F times R. And F is equal to ILV over here. So the torque generated by one coil is two ILV times R. Now consider that we have N coils. There's, there's always more than one coil, right? So we times N uh, two. The T over here, M times two I L V R, is N two I V L R. Okay, you can see that. Now we move uh, I A outside the equation. Oh, so I is over here, and we move the rest inside the parentheses. So why do we uh, do this? Because for a motor, remember when you build a motor, and when the motor is built, all these numbers are fixed. The number of coil, the flux uh, intensity, and the length of the wire, and the uh, radius of the coil, those are all fixed. You cannot change them. Okay, so this is basically a constant. It is a constant. We call it a torque constant. This is fixed. When a motor is built, you cannot change that. What you can change is that you can change the current flowing through the coil. If you increase the, cu the current, the torque will be increased, right? Tm is increased when Ia is increased. Okay, so this is a very important principle. Now we call this uh, 2 times N times V times L times R, the torque constant, okay? And we know the torque is equal to the torque constant times the current, the cause, uh, the torque constant times the current, okay? Now for a DC motor, once the motor is built, these numbers are all fixed. N, V, L, R are fixed. And if we want a DC motor that gives a, a very large torque, what do we need? We need to, well, many, many coils inside that DC motor. We need a flux that is very large. We need what? The wire, the coils are very long, okay? But can we do that? Okay, if we want to have a large uh, torque constant, we need large N, large L, large R, okay? But these three parameters are limited by the weight and the size of motor, okay? So the bigger the motor, the more torque it can generate. So this is like physical condition of the motor, and this is very important. And if we want a large B, a flux uh, field, then we have to understand how a flux is generated. 
maybe you increase the size of the magnets, but it doesn't guarantee that you have a very, very strong flux. And so uh, the previous slide talked about torque generation. And uh, we mentioned about the DC motor works on two principles. Let's go back here. One, the number one is torque generation. Number two is back EMF, right? So we just finished this torque generation. And then we are going to talk about the back EMF. So what is the back EMF? It's a phenomenon. Let's see the details here. Okay. It's basically when a coil is moving in a magnetic flux, it will generate a voltage. It will generate voltage. And the voltage will work against the voltage you provide to the motor. And that this uh, voltage uh, fight back is called back EMF. Back EMF. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, high school of physics uh, that we learned. So uh, suppose we have a magnetic flux V over here. Okay, and we have a, a coil in the field that has a length of L. Okay, and we know that this wire, this coil has a, a uh, speed that is V. Okay, so what uh, back EMF, what voltage that it will generate? Uh, basically, you can see the principle here, like the V cross B is the uh, direction of back EMF. So we know that V, the small V here, this small V uh, is moving toward left of, your, uh, of the slide. And that flux B here is moving up. So you know that V cross B is going inside, inside the slides. That's the direction of your back EMF. So this is direction of back EMF. Okay. And that back EMF is proportional to the length of your wire, of your coil. So you integral the L and integral the e EMF, then you will obtain that your back EMF is V times B times L. This tells us the faster this wire is moving, the larger the back EMF is. The, and the larger of the uh, magnetic flux, the larger of this back EMF is. And the longer this wire is, the larger this back EMF is. Okay? And again, that we suppose that our armature has N coils. Our armature has N coils. So this back EMF is multiplied by N and by 2 because for every a uh, coil. You have like two wires. One is going through inside, the other is going through outside. So we have a uh, two over here and they are N coils. Okay? And we know this uh, V. What is that V? Remember that, uh, let's go back here. Remember, this is a rotational system. So if the speed of this coil is V, right? And what is that V? This V is equal to R times omega. R is what? R is the radius of the coil. V is equal to R omega. So here in this uh, equation, we replace this V 
as r omega and b l are over here b l are over here so this back emf voltage in voltage in volts is 2 n r w b l and according to this we again rearrange the equation we pull the omega outside and the 2 n r b l inside of parenthesis and why is that because when the dc motor is manufactured all these parameters in the parenthesis are fixed the number of coils the radius the magnetic flux and the length of the coil those are uh, fixed so this term is called a back EMF constant back EMF constant and we call it K EMF over here and by contrast to the torque constant KT so KT is the torque constant and K EMF is the back EMF constant. Okay. Now uh, let's stop here a, a little for a little bit, uh, a short time. So basically, what the idea here is that we have two principles. One is the torque generation, and the other is the back EMF generation in a DC motor. So what is happening here? You supply some voltage to DC motor and the DC motor start to rotate and when it is rotating at a uh, angular ve velocity omega it generates some voltage that voltage is the back in EMF voltage and that voltage fight against with the uh, voltage that you provide okay and supposedly these two voltage are uh, the same okay in the steady state so the uh, the principle of the DC motor is that it uh, converts the electrical energy to the dynamic energy and during that uh, uh, conversion that uh, when the two voltages the voltage is supplied to the DC motor and the voltage that is generated by the DC motor the back EMF voltage are equivalent are the same okay now uh, to understand how the DC motor works we have to model it and the modeling uh, is a little bit uh, tricky so I will try to introduce them uh, in a uh, without many uh, mathematical knowledges so let's see what a DC motor system is now uh, in this right hand uh, on your right hand side you see a figure here uh, to a DC motor we supply a, a voltage over here that is our V in okay and the V in will equivalent to the V out okay what is the V out that is the uh, voltage absorbed by the motor and its circuit so here that we assume that a, a DC motor has some resistance that is the RA over here and there's a inductor that is the LA here okay and there's a back EMF the voltage over here okay generated by the motor when the motor is rotating that it generate the back EMF voltage okay and we also assume that the current uh, flowing through this uh, circuit is IA okay so this is the electrical part of the DC motor and what is the dynamic part of the DC motor then we have to assume that the motor has uh, an inertia of JL and the motor is uh, rotating at an angular velocity omega and uh, also the motor generate a torque TM and the motor has a friction of mu okay 
has a friction of mu. Okay, so this is the dynamic part of the motor, and this electrical part has to uh, the the input of the electrical part has to be the output of the dynamic part. They too have has to reach some equilibrium state. Okay, so let's. Uh, look at the electrical subsystem first. So the electrical subsystem is the system on the left hand side. You can see this. So how do we generate the uh, equation for the electrical system? We use Kirchhoff's voltage law. So what does the Kirchhoff voltage law tells us? It tells us that the voltage in is equal to the voltage out. So what is the voltage in? That's the V in, right? What is the voltage out? It's this part. Okay, for the voltage of the resistance, what is the voltage of resistance? The voltage of the resistance is Ra Ia Ra times Ia and what is the voltage of a uh, inductor? It's basically LA times D I A D T. Okay, and what is the voltage across this DC motor? That's the voltage EMF. And these are the output of the system. The input is what is V I N V in. Okay, so we have to uh, write down this equation when the motor reach uh, a balance. So the motor can reach a balance. So you can see this term, these three terms. Okay, and what is the uh, mechanical system of the motor? The mechanical system or the dynamic system of the motor is on the right hand side. So this is the dynamic system. So for the dynamic system, we know Newton's second law, right? What is Newton's second law? It tells us that F is equal to M A. F is the force, M is the mass, and A is the acceleration. But that is in a, a linear system. What is if it is a rotational system? It is torque is equal to the inertia times the angular acceleration. Okay, so from this equation, we can know the torque is Tm, right? And it is equal to the inertia of the motor times the angular velocity, no, the a angular acceleration of the motor. But there's one more term because we assume there is friction, right? So the friction will consume some energy and will give us this equation. So here you can see that JL times D, w, D omega dt times mu omega is equal to Tm that the torque uh, of the motor. And the torque of the motor is equal to kT times Ia. Here kT is the torque constant and Ia is the current going through the motor. Now the next step, uh, knowing these two equations, one is from the electrical subsystem, the other is from the mechanical subsystem. The next step is to solve the equation so that we can model this DC motor. But solving these equations uh, is difficult because these are ordinary differential equations. You see that they are like differential terms over here. And in order to solve the system, we have to introduce one tool. It's called Laplace transform to make it easier for us. So what is Laplace transform? Laplace transform is a kind of a transform. Okay, that is used to solve the linear time invariant ordinary differential equation. Okay, 
and uh, the the idea of is that is uh, it provides using this transform it provides us a very easy way to solve equations because the uh, uh, conventional way solving differential equation is complicated. Basically, you need calculus and integration and convolution. Okay, but using uh, Laplace transform, you can transform the uh, time domain model. What is time domain model? That's the model that we have here. These two equations to frequency domain model, and or called S domain model, and then you use algebraic techniques. I mean addition, multiplication, things like that. Very easy. Then you can solve the frequency domain solution and you do a inverse Laplace transform. You see that uh, minus one here, that's the inverse Laplace transform. Then you can solve this time domain solution. It's quick and easy. So that's the reason why we need Laplace transform. So what do we do in Laplace transform? So I will just introduce a little bit about the Laplace transform. The first is that it has a, a property called linearity. That means the Laplace, if the Laplace transform of a function in time domain, you see this is this, this is f one t, and the transform is f one s. This is capital F. This is lowercase, small case f. Okay, so f one t. The Laplace transform of f one t is f one s, and the Laplace transform of f two t is f two s. And we know a and b are constants, and the Laplace transform of a times f one t plus b times f two b is equal to a uh, times f one s plus b times f two s. So this is called linearity. Linearity. Okay, so knowing this, suppose that we have a function that is u of t is equal to u one of t times a uh, uh, plus four u two of t. What is the Laplace transform of it? Now suppose that the Laplace transform of u one of t is upper u one of s, and u two of t is what? Upper u two of s, and the Laplace transform u of s from this u of t will equal to will equal to. I'm sorry. Let me erase that. Will equal to what? U one of s plus. For u two of s, right? This should be pretty straightforward. Now, you have the uh, answer over there. And another property of Laplace transform uh, is here. Okay. Suppose that uh, the Laplace transform of f of t is f of s. Okay. And for given Zero initial condition, so zero initial condition. The Laplace transform of f prime of t, that is the derivative of f of t, will equal to s f of s. This only stands when uh, the problem is given for zero initial condition. Okay, so that is a very important condition. But let's just assume that we have zero initial condition. So you have, you can see that you have one s over there. That's important property. And on slide number sixteen, you can see a list of a uh, common Laplace transform, and we are not going to explain them in details. I will just. I'll give you this for your reference. Now let's go back for to solve our uh, equations here. 
So what do we have here? These two are the uh, equation that we have in the previous slide. Okay. Then what we want to do is to uh, convert this to uh, Laplace transform equations. So we have L A times D T D I D T that will become L A. D I D T will become S. Let's use capital I A because after Laplace transform everything should be in capital case, right? And times R A I A times K E M F times omega is equal to V I N V in. Okay, for the second equation, there's another derivative over here, right? So it's supposed to be J L times S omega. Okay, times oh, omega times mu omega is equal to T M. That's the motor torque, and motor torque is equal to constant torque constant times I A. So, using Laplace transform, we can convert the original uh, equation in time domain to these two equations in a frequency domain. Okay, so uh, why do we need these uh, equations in a frequency domain? What we want is that we want some to obtain some ideas uh, of the motor. Like, what do you provide to the motor? You provide voltage into the motor, right? And what does the motor generate? Basically, it generates some frequency, I mean, some uh, angular ve velocities. And we want to know how this voltage is converted to this uh, angular velocity. And we want to convert these two equations to some block diagram in the bottom here. Okay, so what do we have here? We know that our VIN is equal to KEMF, let me write them down, EMF, times omega, okay? And also, we know from these two equations, uh, from the first equation, uh, our VIN is related, somehow related to the current. So we have, let me change the color here. We have a current term here and another current term here. That makes sense to me because when you provide voltage to some uh, electrical device, the voltage will be converted to current and the current will drive uh, that uh, circuit, right? So what we want to do here is that we want to move this term over here to the right hand side of the equation and we want to uh, also write down how IA, the current, is related to uh, these two terms. So let me try here. We see that IA times LAS times, here's a S here, RA, that is equal to V in minus K E M F times Omega. Okay. So this tells us what? Suppose we have voltage in here, okay? And we have back EMF here, the constant uh let me change the color of the pen. Say so we have a constant 
K EMF it's a term over here and the uh, omega times the K EMF becomes omega K EMF and their number is minus is minus by VIN and this number this number is what is the term here the right hand side of the equation okay and their number times the term here over 1 LOA S plus RA that term will become the current IA over here okay again what do we say what I'm talking about is that this IA over here how does the motor convert from the voltage to the current IA here basically what uh, does the motor do is the voltage will provide it uh, to the motor uh, minus the back EMF that is the K EMF times Omega okay the number here let me use plus here okay times this term that becomes the current becomes the current that goes into the motor so that's what the first equation tells us okay and what what does the second equation tells us let's change the color again okay it tells us let's look at here that IA here is the IA here right IA here times a constant torque constant KT becomes what becomes a torque TM this term tells us this right okay and the term here let me change it to another color to the green one this term tells us how this torque become uh, how this torque is converted to the angular velocity omega there so how is it uh, converted let's see omega times what JL times S plus mu is equal to TM right so what does it tells us over here your TM times one over JLS times mu will become the Omega here okay so this is uh, what the equation tells us what we have is that uh, once we have the motor we provide some current to the motor the current uh, minus the back EMF and times this term will become current and the current times this term will become torque and torque times this term will become the uh, angular velocity of the motor so this is the dynamic system of the motor so we have a very nice uh, block diagram here in the bottom you can see that now once we have a very nice uh, motor model or motor block diagram here we can generate the transfer function of the motor this transfer function so what is the transfer function transfer function is to describe the output of the model related to the input of the model so the output of the model in this DC motor is the angular velocity of the model and the input is the V in here so 
You'll see this complicated transfer function. You see omega here, v in here. Okay. Uh, uh, please don't look into the details of this transfer function, but at least it tells you how the omega is related to v. And from this transfer function, we'll see a steady state response looks like this. Okay, and for the usage of this model, we call this model is a second order model because here we see the s square here, so we call it as a second order model. And this model is still too complicated uh, for for use, okay, for us to use it. So we have to do model reduction, okay. We reduce the order of the model. Now we suppose that we can ne uh, neglect armature inductance and friction. What does that mean? Let's go back to the very, very back of the equation over here. So that means we can uh, neglect this friction and we can neglect this uh, induction. LA and mu are gone now. So what can we obtain? So basically, if LA is gone, let me erase. This turn is gone. This turn is gone. And what if mu is gone? This turn is gone. Then we have a one equation, one first order equation that looks like this. Okay? And if we have a uh, equation looks like this, we have a steady state gain. A steady state gain is that we set s equal uh, to zero. And we obtain this. So you'll see this term and this term left here. Okay, when s is equal to zero. Okay, and that will give us a gain that is one over k e m f. All right. So uh, then we'll have a system that is roughly looks like this. Okay, and it has a time constant as Tm over here. So what is a time constant? Uh, a time, sorry, let me erase them. A time constant uh, tells us how fast the model will reach the steady state. If the time constant is long, it takes a lot of time for the motor to reach its steady state. If the time constant is short, it takes uh, a short time for the, mo mo uh, for the motor to reach its steady state. So this term is the time constant. And you can relate this equation to that equation. That means you divide all the equation by this term. What does that mean? Kt over Kemf times kt and here we have rj ra jl s over k e m f kt plus 1 because this term divided by itself is 1 right and the term over here before s that is R A J L over K E M F K T. This is the time constant. So the mechanical time constant is this term. Okay. So if you have a very large K E M F K T, your time constant is small. That means your motor will reach the steady state very fast. Okay, so that's the analysis of the uh, motor model. Now let's uh, go to the next uh, step. Next step is the energy conservation at steady state. Okay, so what is the energy conservation at steady state? So once you reach steady set state, 
how does the motor uh, behave? That's something that we are interested in. So what is steady state? Steady state is that you run the motor for a long, long time. Okay, you if you run it a long, long time, okay, and it doesn't change its speed. Everything is at some constant. That's a steady state. Okay, so let's see. We know that model has uh, electrical power and it has a uh, mechanical power too, right? So what what we say the power p is equal to v times i, and it's, it is also equal to torque times omega. Okay, torque times omega. So these two powers are supposed to be identical, because one is the electrical power is the input, the mechanical is the output, because you uh, input some voltage to the motor and it is converted to uh, the rotation of the motor. And if it is a generator, this is the opposite. The input is the what? The dynamic, the mechanical power. And output is, is the electricity, okay? But anyway, let's come back to this equation. We know that Tn here, the uh, mechanical torque, the motor torque, sorry. The motor torque is equal to uh, motor uh, torque constant kt times ia right so we replace this tm using kt ia and the omega here is still there okay so you see uh, this turn is equal to this turn and both of them has ia and this tells us what your voltage will equal to kt times omega. Okay? Your voltage is equal to kt times omega. Now we know kt is a constant, right? The torque constant. This tells us that if you supply a high voltage, that you will give, you will get a large omega. If this is high, this is high too. And if voltage is low, your omega is low. So this is how we control the mot uh, motor velocity using the voltage. So this is the idea, okay? Now let's look into more about the motor characteristic, okay? The motor characteristic. Now we know that uh, for the motor circuit, it looks like this. The equation looks like this. And what if the motor is operated at steady state? And again, at steady state, everything is constant. The speed of the motor is constant. The current you supply to the motor is constant too. So since the current is constant, this term doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so as steady said, that, that term is gone. And what you have is that the input voltage of the motor is equal to the current times the resistance of the motor plus the voltage, EMF voltage of the motor. Okay, so the V in is equal to these two terms. Okay. So how much e V in is uh, into this term and how much V in is into this term? That is something that we are interested in. So let's take a look. Let's uh, take a look. Now this equation is right there. Okay. And we know that this IA, the current is what? We know, we, I, sub, I, I should say, uh, the motor torque is equal to the torque, const torque, time const uh, torque constant times the current, okay? The motor torque is equal to the torque constant times the current. That is from the equation over here, right? 
we obtain that from previous slide. Okay? And we know that V EMF is K EMF times omega. Let's come back here too. Okay? V EMF that's have to go back to many many slides. Let's go. V E M F is E M F constant times omega. Okay, from this equation. So from these equations, we know. We can convert the original equation to this equation. So why are we doing this? You think about that. We want to know like uh, how the velocity of the motor is related to the VE. Okay? And how the torque of the motor is related to VE. We want to find their uh, relationship. So basically, we want to find out how the angular velocity and the torque of the motor related relate to V in. That's something we want to figure out. So we want to look into this information, and to look that information, we want to. Uh, draw a figure that tells us how it looks like. Okay? So let's sort this equation. We move this omega over to the left side of uh, the equation, left hand side of the equation. And we move the rest to the right hand side of the equation. We know that omega is proportional to V in. Okay? Omega is proportional to the V in. That means you increase V, then omega will be increased too. And uh, in that sense, your TM uh, is also proportional to the V in. If you move this to left hand side of the equation, uh, what I'm saying is that okay, let me do this, that will be more clear. Your RA, um, I'm sorry, TM times RA over KT plus omega times KEMF is equal to V in, right? So what does that mean? Let me that's let me show you. This is a torque term that we are interested in, and this is the angular velocity that we are interested in too. So we know Tm is proportional to V in. Uh, Tm is proportional to V in. That means when you increase V in, your Tm should be increased. When you increase omega, V in should be increased. But how do these two terms relate to V uh, to each other? How do they relate to each other? Now let's say this is some some constant. This is a, and this is some constant. This is b. So a is some number, okay? Times t n plus b times omega is equal to v in. So what does this equation look like? If you have an equation, let's say a x plus b y is equal to c, okay? And we know A and B are positive. How does this line look like? That line will look like uh, in this direction, things like that. And when you increase C, that C will increase in that direction. Okay? I'm not sure if you can see this, but we'll show you in another way. That's, that's a, uh, say, if Omega is equal to zero. Okay, if omega this term is equal to zero, this term is equal to zero. So what is that? Tm, Tm, 
over kt times ra is v in y so your tm your torque of the motor is equal to what v in times kt the torque the, uh, constant over ra so when omega is zero when omega is zero there's a point that point is over here and that number of the point is this that is that too okay it's called t stall what is stall that means the motor is not rotating but you provide voltage and the motor just keeps stalling there it doesn't move but it provides you some torque and torque is very large okay and what if it's the case that your omega no not your omega your tm is zero okay if that term is zero what is omega k emf times omega is v in that means the motor doesn't provide any torque that means the motor doesn't have a, a load okay it's uh, just free running your omega is equal to k emf times v in okay so there's another point that is v in over k emf so if you line these two points up this is the equation of this equation right and in your x-axis is tm in your y-axis is omega okay so this is the equation okay okay that's the equation of the omega and when you increase this v in increase your voltage the line will increase uh, will move toward that direction what that means when you increase the voltage your t stall will be increased and your omega no load will be increased too okay so this is why you see a motor you always see this chart for a DC motor if you want to buy some DC motor you can order the catalog from the manufacturer and it will provide you a nice figure looks like this I will see this omega NL T stall that's no loading omega and that's the stall T okay this is the line over there okay and uh, from that line you can know the spec of the motor if the motor doesn't spin at all doesn't move at all like how big the torque you can get this is the largest torque that you can get and if the, the motor doesn't have any load what's the speed it can reach and this is the largest speed that motor can reach those are very important specs and also it tells you like the power of the motor so what's the power of the motor so remember that the power what is the power uh, the power is uh, the torque times angular velocity right so TM times Omega then you can get this nice equation it's a second order equation so you see that power is here that gray line is the power it's a very nice equation and wh what is the maximum power okay you obtain the derivative of this equation so this is P right so you DP the T T is the torque and make it equal to zero and you can obtain that the maximum power and of some T that T is T stall half of the T stall okay and you uh, substitute this T into the equation you will obtain P max I will leave this to uh, for you to calculate alright so that's the modeling of the DC motor and also I uh, just uh, told you that uh, how to read the spec the data sheet of a motor and when the motor comes and sometimes we order a gearbox over here and the purpose of a gearbox is to, ex to uh, change the velocity or change the torque of the motor 
If you reduce the velocity, you will have a higher torque. If you reduce the torque, you have a higher velocity. That's the principle of the gear heads. Now let's talk about a little bit uh, how to drive DC motors. So for you to drive a DC motor, it's pretty straightforward. That if you want the motor to drive, just supply some voltage. That's true, but what if you want to motor, uh, the motor to drive in, an, in the other direction? And uh, as the figure you can see here, you may say that, oh, I just uh, swap the anode and cathode, okay, from the battery. That works, but how do you physically switch them uh, in the field? It's not possible. So basically, that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about now. So the basic idea is that they are uh, when we want to drive the motor. Uh, how do we do that? We usually have a microcontroller or computer to drive a motor, but the power from microcontroller is very very small. So the first idea is that you need some amplifiers for driving the motor. So the amplifiers. Uh, will increase the current that can be uh, going through the motor. Say, uh, you learn some uh, electronic devices like the BJT or CMOS devices. So for example, this is a BJT device. Okay, and when you turn on the current from B to E, the current from C to E will be, uh, well, be turned on too, right? So then that's the current from C to E can be large current. So the uh, current going through the motor can be larger. So this is the idea of that. And if you say, you say VJT, that the current you can drive a motor is about 1 amp. And now let's talk am about another uh, principle about motor driving. So, uh, if we want to drive motor in one direction, it's pretty straightforward. It's like uh, just like this uh, figure that is showing. But if we want to drive the motor in two direction, you need something that's called an H bridge. So, what is a H bridge? It's a uh, bridge that you have four switches. One, two, three, four. And the uh, appropriate combination of the switch will make the mot uh, motor turn uh, different directions. So for example, if we turn on this switch one and this switch four, that the current will go into the motor will be this direction. And if you turn on the switch 2 and switch 3 together, the current will uh, actually flow through the motor through this direction. And they are opposite. And that's why we can drive the motor using the H bridge, uh, drive the motor in di different direction using the H bridge. So for example, if you turn on 1 and 4, the motor will rotate this direction. And if you turn on 2 and 3, and the current will, uh, the motor will uh, rotate in this direction. Okay, that's called H bridge. And as I said, that H bridge has uh, several switches. So you can see that we have PM, PM, PN, those uh, BJT devices. And with these BJT devices, you can build a H bridge. Okay, and the commercial H bridges are available. So what we have is, uh, at least we have like a LO293D, LO298, LMD, uh, 18200, uh, those chips are available. So, uh, if you need this H bridge, just uh, uh, go purchase one. 
Okay, and uh, the next topic we want we will talk about is the encoder. So, what are encoders? Encoders are actually uh, some uh, position detectors for DC motors. So, thinking about that, we have motor to control, but if we don't know its position, how do we control it? And that's the reason why we need uh, encoder. So encoder is a is a the position sensor. Of a DC motor. Okay, that's the key point. And so the uh, purpose is that uh, if we want to control the DC motor. Okay, we read. We need to read its uh, position. Then the position will send back to the controller, and so the controller can generate appropriate control signal to the DC motor. And uh, that's the story. And uh, we won't cover the the uh, automatic control in this chapter, but in next chapter, uh, it will be covered. Okay, so that's. We have several different kind of encoders. Let's go through them one by one. And the very first one is the analog position encoder. So what's an analog position encoder? It's say a uh, potentiometer. So potentiometer changes the reading of its uh, uh, resistance. It's like uh, you provide V high over here and the ground over here. So this is a resistor over here. And when you rotate this uh, potentiometer, you basically change the location of this head, and this head can give you some voltage over here. I'm sorry. That's your potentiometer. Okay, and uh, so what's the uh, advantage of potentiometer? It's simple and low cost. Okay, of course, but. The problem is that uh, it wears out because there's a friction between the reading head and uh, the uh, resistor. Okay, and also there's a problem. It is nonlinear. You see the, this dash line? That's the ideal line of the potentiometer. But actually, it doesn't follow the uh, this dash line very well. So this is the problem that uh, we need. Uh, we 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 cannot get that uh, line, and we get these two curved lines over there. Oh, that's the problem. We need some other kind of uh, uh, encoder, and another encoder is magnetic encoder. So magnetic encoder is like a chip, okay, and the chip will sense uh, the mag uh, magnets on a DC motor. So this is a DC motor, and in the uh, back of the DC motor, uh, it is connected to a magnet, and this magnet sensor, magnetic sensor, will uh, read the readings of the magnets. So uh, this is called magnetic encoder. It is uh, very accurate and contactless, but it's more expensive. Okay. And the other type of uh, digital position measurement, a uh, digital encoder, is called optical encoder. So, what is an optical encoder? Uh, in a sense that it comes with two sensors, not two sensors, a pair of sensors. One is the uh, emitters, or, or say the light source. The other is the light sensor, or say the receiver. Okay, and there's a wheel. Here you can see that uh, they are uh, carved uh, empty part of the wheel. Okay, and when the wheel rotates, that light will go through uh, from the empty part, and well, and the light uh, sensor, the receiver, will receive the signal. Okay, then you will see that uh, uh, the wheel is rotating, and the sensor. Is uh, the reading of the sensor signal is changing, 
and let's see a video a demo video here that's the wheel and that's the emitter and receiver pair and that emitter and receiver pair is also enclosed in uh, this box and you can see one is red and the other is white that's the pair and you can see this uh, LED light the light is on when the receiver receives a signal so when you rotate the wheel you can see that the LED flashes and if you uh, rotate the wheel faster the LED flashes faster okay and there are two types of uh, uh, optical encoders one is the incremental encoder and the other is the absolute encoder and we'll talk about them one by one so what is incremental encoder? So basically, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, they only generate pulses, okay? But it doesn't tell you the absolute location in, uh, on the encoder, okay? And what does it do is that it uses a light, res uh, light source to emit some light, and there's a, also a light detector, okay? And this signal will be converted to uh, some uh, electrical condition signal and tells your controller to control the uh, location or position of the motor and what you actually will receive actually is actually like this encoder signal because uh, it's continuous signal and what you want to uh, convert it to is some uh, uh, square waves okay and uh, th there's a conversion you have to do so for the optical encoder uh, this one has one problem the problem is that you cannot tell uh, which direction that you are rotating toward counterclockwise or uh, clockwise okay so there are two directions so uh, because of that reason there's another uh, incremental encoder is called quadrature encoder so what is a quadrature encoder uh, actually uh, it's a pair of two emitters and two receivers okay and uh, for the uh, these two pairs their face is 90 degree off so this is like a face uh, how do I say 90 degree so let's say this is a square wave and this is 360 degree okay and a quarter of that is 90 degree so this is 90 degree so for the two receiver and two emitter the encoding uh, is 90 degree off say 90 degree off and that's called a quadrature which because a quarter is one fourth right so so quadrature the uh, the name it comes with that it's uh, the difference is a quarter of the uh, 360 degree so how does uh, this uh, quadrature tell us the direction uh, of the, uh, the the encoder uh, for example, if we keep track the falling edge, let me erase it. So, see, this is a square wave. When uh, s signal is high, we call this is high. Uh, signal in the bottom, we call this is low. Low signal, high level signal low level signal and for this age we call it 
rising age. For this age, we call it falling age. Okay, those are the terminology of a square wave. So, uh, if in a uh, quadrature encoder, and we keep track one channel, say there are two channels, one is channel one, and the other is channel two. And we, if we keep track the falling edge, so these three are falling edge, okay? Right after falling edge, you can see that channel two has a falling edge too, see? It's falling, it's falling. And this is counterclockwise. But if you check the falling edge of channel one, falling edge of channel one, and you see uh, rising edge right after the falling edge, so this is clockwise. So from this uh, mechanism, you can tell which direction that the encoder is rotating toward the counterclockwise or the clockwise. So that's the reason why uh, we need quadrature encoder. It's very uh, useful. Okay, for the quadrature decoding, there are uh, four, uh, there are three modes. 1x mode, 2x mode, and or 4x mode. So what can it do? So for 1x uh, decoding, this mode, what does it do is that it only track uh, the rising edge of one channel. So say rising edge of channel A, rising edge of channel A, rising edge of channel A. So you get one signal here, here, and here. Okay, for the 2x decoding, you track the rising uh, edge and the falling edge of one channel. Say, you track the rising edge and falling edge of channel A. So you see that this rising edge, this falling edge, this rising edge, this falling edge, this rising edge. For 4x decoding, you basically track uh, the edges of all channels, the, both the two channels. So rising edge of channel A and rising a uh, falling edge of channel A, rising edge of channel B and falling edge of channel B, both of them. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is the 4x mode. So for the 2x mode, now let's go back to 1x mode. For 1x mode, this is not capable. of tracking direction. Okay, that's a problem. But uh, for 2x mode and 4x mode, we can track the direction. So, let's see. If, uh, if the encoder is at the forward direction, and we if we check the rising edge and falling edge of channel A, what you have to check is that at channel B, after, right after a rising edge or falling edge, is positive or negative, or it's zero or one. So if this is high level, it is one. If this low level, it's zero, right? So right after a, in a falling, uh, rising edge and at this moment, you see that, let me use a green, a, channel A is high, so A is equal to 1, right? Channel V is low, so V is 0. Now, for another falling edge from channel A, that channel A is 0, is low, but channel V is high. Okay, for another rising edge, channel A is high, channel V is low. For another f low falling edge, direction is wrong. Let me erase it. This is falling edge, not rising edge. So channel A is low, channel V is high. Low, high you see that A is not equal to B, and this is forward direction. What is for reverse direction? 
Uh, if channel A is high and channel V is high, channel A is low, channel V is low, channel A is high again, channel V is high, channel A is low, channel V is low. So A and B are equal. A is equal to B. That's reverse direction. So from 2x mode that you can actually detect the direction of the encoder. So for the 4x mode, it's very similar. And in 4x mode, we check both of the channels for position. So we check the uh, rising edge of A, falling edge of A, all of them. And also the rising edge of B, falling edge of B. Okay, so we have this 4x uh, mode. And also to check the direction in 4x mode, that uh, we check only one channel. For so, for example, we check uh, channel A to see if it's equal to V. If channel A is not equal to V, it's forward direction. And for the reverse direction, it's the same. We check channel A, see if the channel A is equal to V. That is reverse direction okay so you check one channel for the direction okay so that's the 4x mode okay and here is the advantage and the disadvantage of the uh, incremental optical encoder okay and uh, one problem is that that uh, it gives you the incremental position only there's no absolute information you tell uh, it tells us like uh, if it's increasing or it's decreasing okay and if there's a an error that you cannot be tell you cannot be told and a causation can run very fast so you need a system that has a very fast clock uh, cycle to read causatures so here are the uh, causatures uh, incremental quadratures. And there's another quadrature, optical quadrature, called absolute encoder. So in the absolute encoder, it has many bits. As you can see here, we have uh, bits 0, 1, 2, 3, these four bits. And each bit is corresponding to one light source. And in this encoder, you can see these four bits are uh, all have different uh, readings. So uh, from these readings, you can uh, know the absolute uh, position of the encoder. And usually we uh, encode this uh, using gray code. That's what we uh, told uh, in the previous unit. Okay, And uh, absolute encoder tells you the absolute position of the encoder. So it is better. But in a sense, if you want to manufacture a encoder with many bits, it's going to be very expensive. So there are pros and cons. All right, and uh, we finish uh, pretty much up uh, the encoders, the DC motors. Now we are going to move to other motors. Uh, so we are going to introduce three motors in this uh, section, uh, including stepper motor, uh, DC brushless motor, an RC servo motor. So what is a stepper motor? We know that DC motor can keep rotates, keep rotates, but it cannot uh, rotate to a fixed position, uh, except that you use a uh, external controller. But for stepper motor, you can actually move uh, and start motor at a fixed position. That's uh, called stepper motor. And the other uh, way to think about step motor is that it uh, it moves step by step gradually around a circle, right, around a rotation. Okay, and there are two types of step motor. One is permanent magnet. The other is variable uh, reluctance motor. And also uh, the other uh, the other type is hybrid motor. Uh, hybrid is uh, both the PM and VR, the hybrid of them too. So let's look at 
uh, how a stepper motor operates. So let's say, for example, if we have a stepper motor, and there are several wires in this stepper motor. You can see there's a wire A1 and A2, the, uh, the red coil. And there's another wire, B1 and B2, the uh, blue coil. And there's a uh, permanent magnet inside this coil. Okay? And suppose we want to operate this stepper motor. What we do is that we uh, provide voltage through the coil A1, A2, or provide voltage to the coil B1, B2. So, for example, if we provide coil, a voltage to coil A1, A2 and make it on, okay, then you provide a uh, magnetic field, and this side is N, and this side is S, north and south, okay. Then, since this side is north, so in the permanent magnets, the S, the south, will be attracted by this north here. So the motor, the S will uh, face upward, okay? And then if you change uh, the voltage provided to A1, A2, B1, B2, uh, uh, basically you turn off A1, A2. Now you turn on B1, B2 and make this side north and this side south. The motor will move from upward to uh, this direction uh, clockwisely, right? And if then you again excite uh, the coil A1, A2, by in this time, you make the nose in the bottom, south in the top, okay? The permanent magnets will uh, turn again, okay? Then you excite B1, B2 again, then the motor turn again. So effectively, you keep the motor uh, rotating in the center of the field by changing the magnetic field outside the, mo the motor. So the ro rotary is a permanent magnet. It keeps rotating because you change the, the magnet field outside. So this is uh, called a a permanent magnet stepper motor operation. And this is called full stepping, one phase on. So every time you turn on either A1, A2 or B1, B2, turn on A1, A2 or B1, B2. So this is called one phase on. And you can uh, actually do two phase on. Do two phase on. How do you do that? Let's uh, take a look. So you first uh, turn on A1 and A2 and you make uh, both this side N okay since you have two N over here right so your actual nose is this direction so your motor rotator rotary will uh, the south of the rotary will be attracted by this N the motor will turn half of the step okay then next, you turn on A1, A2, B1, B2 again. But uh, this time, let me change the color. You have one end here, one end there. And you notice is this direction. So your motor will rotate 90 degrees like this. Then next, you excite A1, A2, and B1, B2 again. But this time you have N over here, nose over here, nose over here. The actual nose will be, the accumulate nose will be over here. And the motor rotary will, ro the south of motor rotary will be attracted by this N here, okay? And next step, the end will be this one and this one and nose will be this one and the rotary uh, south will face to the nose here. Okay, so this is called like two face on and full stepping too. Full stepping me means it rotates like a 90 degree at one time. But by mixing this uh, 
one face on in uh, let me see one face on in slide number 48 and mixing the two face on in slide number 49 you can uh, actually generate like half stepping and one and face one face and two face on okay you can generate like uh, half stepping let me half stepping by mixing one face and two face operation okay and how do we drive uh, the stepper motors like they are unipolar and bipolar operations okay you can see the wire here we have a bipolar connection here 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 and here okay and we have unipolar connection here here okay you, uh, if you can see like the difference between bipolar and unipolar is that uh, for unipolar there's a wire uh, in the middle of the coil so there's a wire in the middle of the coil okay but for bipolar there's no wire in the middle of the coil okay and if we want to drive motor using bipolar connection we will need H bridge we'll need H bridge okay uh, that's a cumbersome okay and unipolar is more han uh, handy that you don't need an edge bridge just simple circuits okay let's take a look how it is operated let's say uh, if uh, we have a motor over here a stepper motor and we have a edge bridge so this is for bipolar system okay and how it is operated so uh, the first is that you excite A and B at the same direction then you excite A and B A in the opposite direction you see the B is in blue now then you excite uh, A and B in the same direction and you excite A and B in opposite direction again okay so the motor will rotate and you keep these steps uh, again and again the motor will rotor will uh, rotate uh, at one direction okay and this is called like a normal four step sequence and this is uh, a four step and you can do half step and doing half step you can have eight step sequence and this eight step sequence is just what I told you about that in the slide uh, let me see 40 8 and 49 you use uh, one face on and two face on approaches mix them together and let's take a look so look at the chart over here you can see their difference to do that you uh, actually uh, turn on channel A and turn off channel B and uh, turn on V again and V uh, off again okay and you keep to uh, do, keep doing that and the motor will rotate half step at each time half step at each time and basically it's going to be a air step sequence okay and here is uh, showing the difference over here uh, just for your reference and they are stepper motor driver chips available commercial chips available if you want to drive 
are the motors and you can just purchase these chips and the winding configuration uh, it really depends on if uh, it's going to be like uh, unipolar or bipolar okay and different uh, winding has different uh, uh, well uh, different way to connect them to appropriate uh, control signal from the microcontroller so it's actually very important to understand which winding you want and which kind of uh, stepper motor you need okay and this is the torque and speed curve of the uh, stepper motor you can see it is not a straight line as we want as we have in DC motor if it's going to be DC motor it's a straight line so this red line is the DC motor for the uh, stepper motor it's a curve looks like this okay and from pr uh, previous slide we know that stepper motor has a speed limit here is the speed limit what if you uh, exceed this speed limit what's going on let's take a look uh, of a demo video over here here we have a stepper motor from a hard drive from a computer that's being driven by a PIC microcontroller it's running a PIC basic pro program that generates a square wave that sequences the coils in the stepper through a set of transistors to increase the step rate of the motor right now it's stepping at a very slow speed and you can notice the classic a second order system response where you get overshoot and oscillation on each step the system has very little damping now that the speed is increasing we're starting to get closer and closer to the natural frequency of this motor system when we reach the natural frequency you're going to get resonance so the amplitude will grow so large that the electronics will try to force the motor to do something that it can't and it will miss some steps and we're getting close to that right now very large amplitude oscillation there is there are the missteps as the speed increases further eventually the motor will sync up again with the magnetic fields and the rotation rate will again correspond with the square wave output from the chip there it is we're back in sync now when the speed of the square wave from the chip is increased dramatically the motor has a lot of momentum now so as the magnetic fields are stepped around the perimeter the rotor keeps up with those and the result is a very smooth motion now we move to the next motor the brushless DC motor or uh, as known as the uh, VLDC motor now uh, the a brushless DC motor has an uh, internal permanent magnet rotor over here and also there it has a uh, external electromagnetic stator okay in the stator that we can change uh, the magnetic field okay so the rotor can rotate okay and also there are sensors in the magnetic field that can sense uh, where or which direction which position that the rotor is okay so these are magnetic field sensors the yellow ones okay let's take a look of inside uh, VLDC motor this is a brushless DC motor from a computer fan that helps keep the circuit boards inside of a computer from overheating like a permanent magnet DC motor it has permanent magnets in the stator of the motor and it has coils on the rotor unlike a permanent magnet DC motor that uses commutators to switch the direction of current in the rotor coils this motor has a series of Hall effect sensors inside these little white things beneath the circuit board and when those sensors go past the state of magnetic fields they pick up the change in field and can electronically switch the current direction in the rotor coils always maintaining torque in the same direction allowing the motor to continue to spin so again we only have a power and ground line coming in 
and some electronics that do the commutation based on the center signals from the Hall effect sensors. And that spins the fan. Now, let's take a look how the VLDC motor uh, operates. Now, uh, inside the uh, VLDC motor, that's the uh, rotator. And we know that we can change the magnetic field direction uh, using the electromagnetic stator outside. So, if we uh, change the magnetic field, you see that rotator will keep rotates. And how do we know when to change that magnetic field? That is uh, from the field sensors, the yellow sensors inside. Okay, so here you can see the uh, working principle of the, uh, uh, the BLDC motor. And the important part is that the commutation of the BLDC motor is handled electronically rather than using the uh, commutator and that is uh, mechanically in the DC motor. So that's the most different uh, part of BLDC motor. And because you don't have a commutator or brush, you can uh, reduce the friction of the uh, BLDC motor. So BLDC motor can rotate at a very fast uh, speed. Okay, and let's see how it works. Uh, the control circuit works. So basically, what you want to do first is to, to turn on uh, the uh, switch A1 and B2. Okay, then there's a current going through this direction. Then you turn on C1 and B2, and current going through this direction. Then you turn on C1 and A2, the current goes going through this direction. Then B1 and A2, and this is doing like the switch. Then turn on uh, C, uh, B1 and C2, then turn on A1 and C2, then go back to A1 and B2. And by doing this, uh, six steps that you can uh, rotate the BLDC motor in one rotation. Okay, so this is just the animation of the rotation of the uh, BLDC motors from the previous slide. The next topic that we would like to move to is the RC servo motor. Okay, and here you can see an RC servo motor uh, in this photo. So what is an RC servo motor? The full name is Radio Control Servo Motor. In a sense that uh, uh, it is used to, uh, it is used for the uh, RC cars, those radio control cars, uh, for the toys, but it can be used in many applications too. So, what does it? Uh, how does it work? From this figure, you can see this RC servo motor has a built-in circuit, a gearbox, and a motor over there. Okay, and uh, it's it's actually. Uh, uh, total solution in a sense that it, uh, the motor itself is composed of many components. Okay, and we'll explain the components later. But let's see what con uh, what kind of uh, RC servo motor we have. We have one standard servo motor. Okay, uh, standard servo motor can turn to a specific angle. Okay, and the other type is type to the continuous rotation servo motors and it keeps turning turning counterclockwise or turning clockwise that's called the continuous rotation servo motor okay and how is the servo motor control it is controlled by PWM signal and what are PWM signal just thinking uh, they are square waves as you can see here they are square waves Okay, so let's take a look what is inside the RC servo motor. The RC servo motor, uh, if you open it up, you can see there are drive gears, okay, and there's a case, that's a black case. And inside case, you can see one motor, and also you can see one control circuit, and there's a potential armature. 
Okay, and potentiometer is used to adjust the sensitivity of the uh, signal to the motor. And inside this motor, it has a controller. So you can see that uh, the controller uh, use feedback control. In this diagram, you can see a feedback control uh, block diagram. Uh, use this, uh, the controller use this mechanism to control the position or the rotational speed of this uh, RC servo motor. So you can see it's very simple, and but it works very well in some application. And how do we control the RC servo motor? Basically, we can generate different square waves, and the square waves going into the RC servo motor will uh, give it some different commands. So, for example, if the high pulse is 1.3 millisecond or 1.5 millisecond or 1.7 millisecond, it has different action. So, for 1.3 millisecond, will turn right 1.5. Is uh, doesn't do anything, and 1.7 is uh, turn uh, counterclockwise, and these uh, signals are connected to RC servo motor and fit in the RC servo motor. Use uh, this uh, yellow line. So on each RC servo motor, you will see like there will be three lines. Let me see. I don't have a figure here. But this figure tells you there will be three lines. One is the red line, that is the 5 volt or VCC line. And black line is the ground line. And there's a yellow line, that's the line where you fit in this PWM signal. And let's look into a demo video. This is a servo motor unit, very common to what you're going to see in. Uh, radio controlled cars and airplanes. Uh, it runs off of a 5 volt DC line and the position of the output shaft is controlled by the width of a pulse which it receives. Uh, this kind of control is called pulse width modulation. Width of the pulse is displayed here on the oscilloscope. The position that it rotates the servo motor to uh, is actually is going to be related with the width of this uh, pulse. Right now it's sitting at its middle position if we want it to rotate to the left, we will change the frequency uh, so that the pulse is wider. And he rotates to his far left position. We want to go into the far right position. We change the frequency and give it a uh, narrower pulse. Go to the far right position. And if we want to go back to the center position, of course, or anywhere else in between, we can do that as well by giving it the appropriate pulse width. And in this table, there's a comparison of these uh, three types of motors. And the stepper motor, the brushless DC motor, and the RC servo motor. And uh, so, what you can see that the brushless DC motor performs very well, but the cost is very high. and But the control is also complicated too. Then uh, for the RC servo motor, it is uh, at low cost, very cheap. and uh, but uh, the accuracy is not very good. For the stepper motor, okay, it has some resonance effect that your speed has a very, uh, a very slow limit, and it's slower than a DC servo motor. But it is very uh, precise in its step. So position control without feedback, that's very good. Okay, and that's uh, everything I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.